Section 52 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. Section 52. Selected Works by Roger Ascham, 1515-1568. This noted scholar owes his place in English literature to his pure, vigorous English prose. John Tyndall and Sir Thomas More, his predecessors, had perhaps equaled him in the flexible and simple use of his native tongue, but they had not surpassed him. The usage of the time was still to write works of importance in Latin, and Ascham was master of a good Ciceronian Latin style. It is to his credit that he urged on his countrymen the writing of English, and set them an example of its vigorous use. He was the son of John Ascham, house steward to Lord Scrope of Bolton, and was born at Kirkby Wisk near Northallerton in 1515. At the age of fifteen he entered St. John's College, Cambridge, where he applied himself to Greek and Latin, mathematics, music, and penmanship. He had great success in teaching and improving the study of the classics, but seems to have had a somewhat checkered academic career, both as student and teacher. His poverty was excessive, and he made many unsuccessful attempts to secure patronage and position, till at length in 1545 he published his famous treatise on archery, Toxophilus, which he presented to Henry the Eighth in the picture gallery at Greenwich, and which obtained for him a small pension. The treatise is in the form of a dialogue, the first part being an argument in favor of archery, and the second instructions for its practice. In its pages he makes a plea for the literary use of the English tongue. After long continued disappointment and trouble, he was finally successful in obtaining the position of tutor to the Princess Elizabeth in 1548. She was fifteen years old, and he found her an apt scholar, but the life was irksome, and in 1550 he resigned the post to return to Cambridge as public orator. Whence one may guess, as a main reason for so excellent a teacher having so hard a time to live, that, like many others, he liked to talk about his profession better than to practice it. Going abroad shortly afterward as secretary to Sir Richard Morrison, ambassador to Charles V, he remained with him until 1553, when he received the appointment of Latin secretary to Queen Mary. It is said that he wrote for her forty-seven letters in his fine Latin style in three days. At the accession of Elizabeth he received the office of the Queen's private tutor. Poverty and household griefs still gave him anxiety, but during the five years which elapsed between 1563 and his death in 1568, he found some comfort in the composition of his Schoolmaster, which was published by his widow in 1570. It was suggested by a conversation at Windsor with Sir William Cecil on the proper method of bringing up children. Sir Richard Sackville was so well pleased with Ascham's theories that he, with others, entreated him to write a practical work on the subject. The schoolmaster argues in favor of gentleness rather than force on the part of an instructor. Then he commends his own method of teaching Latin by double translation, offers remarks on Latin prosody, and touches on other pedagogic themes. Both this and the Toxophilus show a pure, straightforward, easy style. Contemporary testimony to its beauty may be found in an appendix to Mayer's edition of The Schoolmaster, 1863, though Dr. Johnson, in a memoir prefixed to Rennet's collected edition of Ascham's English Works, 1771, says that he was scarcely known as an author in his own language 
till Mr. Upton published his schoolmaster in 1771. He has remained, however, the best-known type of a great teacher in the popular memory, in part, perhaps, through his great pupil. The best collected edition of his works, including his Latin letters, was published by Dr. Giles in 1864-65. to There is an authoritative edition of the schoolmaster in the Arbor series of old English reprints. The best account of his system of education is in R. H. Quick's Essays on Educational Reformers, 1868. On Gentleness in Education from The Schoolmaster Yet some will say that children of nature love pastime and mislike learning, because in their kind the one is easy and pleasant, the other hard and wearisome which is an opinion not so true as some men ween. For the matter lieth not so much in the disposition of them that be young, as in the order and manner of bringing up by them that be old, nor yet in the difference of learning and pastime. For beat a child if he dance not well, and cherish him though he learn not well, you shall have him unwilling to go to dance, and glad to go to his book. Knock him always when he draweth his shaft ill, and favour him again, though he fault at his book, you shall have him very loath to be in the field, and very willing to be in the school. Yea, I say more, and not of myself, but by the judgment of those from whom few wise men will gladly dissent, that if ever the nature of man be given at any time more than other to receive goodness, it is in innocency of young years, before that experience of evil have taken root in him. For the pure clean wit of a sweet young babe is like the newest wax, most able to receive the best and fairest printing, and like a new bright silver dish never occupied, to receive and keep clean any good thing that is put into it. And thus will in children, wisely wrought withal, may easily be one to be very well willing to learn. And wit in children, by nature, namely memory, the only key and keeper of all learning, is readiest to receive and surest to keep any manner of thing that is learned in youth. This, lewd and learned, by common experience, know to be most true. For we remember nothing so well when we be old as those things which we learned when we were young. And this is not strange, but common in all nature's works. Every man seeth, as I said before, new wax is best for printing, new clay fittest for working, new shorn wool aptest for soon and surest dying new fresh flesh for good and durable salting. And this similitude is not rude nor borrowed of the larger house, but out of his schoolhouse, of whom the wisest of England need not be ashamed to learn. Young grafts grow not only soonest but also fairest, and bring always forth the best and sweetest fruit. Young whelps learn easily to carry, young popinjays learn quickly to speak. And so, to be short, if in all other things, though they lack reason, sense, and life, the similitude of youth is fittest to all goodness, surely nature in mankind is most beneficial and effectual in their behalf. Therefore, if to the goodness of nature be joined the wisdom of the teacher in leading young wits into a right and plain way of learning, Surely children kept up in God's fear, and governed by his grace, may most easily be brought well to serve God and their country, both by virtue and wisdom. But if will and wit by far their age be once allured from innocency, delighted in vain sights, filled with foul talk, crooked with willfulness, hardened with stubbornness, and let loose to disobedience, Surely it is hard with gentleness, but impossible with severe cruelty, to call them back to good frame again. For where the one perchance may bend it, the other shall surely break it, 
and so instead of some hope leave an assured desperation and shameless contempt of all goodness the furthest point in all mischief as xenophon doth most truly and most wittily mark therefore to love or to hate to like or condemn to ply this way or that way to good or to bad ye shall have as ye use a child in his youth and one example whether love or fear doth work more in a child for virtue and learning i will gladly report which may be heard with some pleasure and followed with more profit before i went into germany i came to broadgate in leicestershire to take my leave of that noble lady jane grey to whom i was exceeding much beholding her parents the duke and duchess with all the household gentlemen and gentlewomen were hunting in the park i found her in her chamber reading phido platonus in greek and that with as much delight as some gentlemen would read a merry tale in boccace after salutation and duty done with some other talk i asked her why she would lease lose such pastime in the park smiling she answered me i wis all their sport in the park is but a shadow to that pleasure that i find in plato alas good folk they never felt what true pleasure meant and how came you madam quoth i to this deep knowledge of pleasure and what did chiefly allure you unto it seeing not many women but very few men have attained thereunto i will tell you quoth she and tell you a truth which perchance ye will marvel at one of the greatest benefits that ever god gave me is that he sent me so sharp and severe parents and so gentle a schoolmaster for when i am in presence either of father or mother whether i speak keep silence sit stand or go eat drink be merry or sad be sewing playing dancing or doing anything else i must do it as it were in such weight measure and number even so perfectly as god made the world or else i am so sharply taunted so cruelly threatened yea presently sometimes with pinches nips and bobs and other ways which i will not name for the honour i bear them so without measure misordered that i think myself in hell till time come that i must go to mr elmer who teacheth me so gently so pleasantly with such fair allurements to learning that i think all the time nothing whiles i am with him and when i am called from him i fall on weeping because whatsoever i do else but learning is full of grief trouble fear and whole misliking unto me and thus my book hath been so much my pleasure and bringeth daily to me more pleasure and more that in respect of it all other pleasures in very deed be but trifles and troubles unto me i remember this talk gladly both because it is so worthy of memory and because also it was the last talk that ever i had and the last time that ever i saw that noble and worthy lady on study and exercise from toxophilus philologe but now to our shooting toxophile again wherein i suppose you cannot say so much for shooting to be fit for learning as you have spoken against music for the same therefore as concerning music i can be content to grant you your mind but as for shooting surely i suppose that you cannot persuade me by no means that a man can be earnest in it and earnest at his book too but rather i think that a man with a bow on his back and shafts under his girdle is more fit to wait upon robin hood than upon apollo or the muses toxophile over earnest shooting surely i will not over earnestly defend for i ever thought shooting should be a waiter upon learning not a mistress over learning yet this i marvel not a little at that ye think a man with a bow on his back is more like robin hood's servant than apollo's seeing that apollo himself in alcestis of euripides which tragedy you read openly not long ago in a manner glorieth saying this verse 
it is my wont always my bow with me to bear therefore a learned man ought not too much to be ashamed to bear that sometime which apollo god of learning himself was not ashamed always to bear and because you would have a man wait upon the muses and not at all meddle with shooting i marvel that you do not remember how that the nine muses their self as soon as they were born were put to nurse to a lady called euphemus which had a son named erotus with whom the nine muses for his excellent shooting kept ever more company withal and used daily to shoot together in the mount parnassus and at last it chanced this erotus to die whose death the muses lamented greatly and fell all upon their knees afore jupiter their father and at their request erotus for shooting with the muses on earth was made a sign and called sagittarius in heaven therefore you see that if apollo and the muses either were examples indeed or only feigned of wise men to be examples of learning honest shooting may well enough be companion with honest study philologe well toxophile if you have no stronger defence of shooting than poets i fear if your companions which love shooting heard you they would think you made it but a trifling and fabling matter rather than any other man that loveth not shooting could be persuaded by this reason to love it toxophile even as i am not so fond but i know that these be fables so i am sure you be not so ignorant but you know what such noble wits as the poets had meant by such matters which oftentimes under the covering of a fable do hide and wrap in goodly precepts of philosophy with the true judgment of things which to be true specially in homer and euripides plato aristotle and galen plainly do show when through all their works in a manner they determine all controversies by these two poets and such like authorities therefore if in this matter i seem to fable and nothing prove i am content you judge so on me seeing the same judgment shall condemn with me plato aristotle and galen whom in that error i am well content to follow if these old examples prove nothing for shooting what say you to this that the best learned and sagest men in this realm which be now alive both love shooting and use shooting as the best learned bishops that be amongst whom philologe you yourself know four or five which as in all good learning virtue and sageness they give other men example what thing they should do even so by their shooting they plainly show what honest pastime other men given to learning may honestly use that earnest study must be recreated with honest pastime sufficiently i have proved afore both by reason and authority of the best learned men that ever wrote then seeing pastimes be lethal lawful the most fittest for learning is to be sought for a pastime saith aristotle must be like a medicine medicines stand by contraries therefore the nature of studying considered the fittest pastime shall soon appear in study every part of the body is idle which thing causeth gross and cold humours to gather together and vex scholars very much the mind is altogether bent and set on work a pastime then must be had where every part of the body must be laboured to separate and lessen such humours withal the mind must be unbent to gather and fetch again his quickness withal thus pastimes for the mind only be nothing fit for students because the body which is most hurt by study should take away no profit thereat this knew erasmus very well when he was here at cambridge which when he had been sore at his book as garrett our bookbinder had very often told me for lack of better exercise would take his horse and ride about the market hill and come again if a scholar should use bowls or tennis the labour is too vehement and unequal 
which is condemned of Galen. The example very ill for other men, when by so many acts they be made unlawful. Running, leaping, and quiting be too vile for scholars, and so not fit by Aristotle's judgment. Walking alone into the field hath no token of courage in it, a pastime like a simple man which is neither flesh nor fish. Therefore, if a man would have a pastime wholesome and equal for every part of the body, pleasant and full of courage for the mind, not vile and unhonest to give ill example to laymen, not kept in gardens and corners, not lurking on the night and in holes, but evermore in the face of men, either to rebuke it when it doeth ill, or else to testify on it when it doth well, let him seek chiefly of all other for shooting. End of section 52